Okay, I'm back after pouring myself a well-earned cup of coffee, and it's not just any cup. Uh, at least from my viewpoint, it's uh, backwards, but no matter. Up until now, uh, this homebrew transceiver project has been uh, pretty much conventional, uh, at least when I got done messing things up. The audio section uh, illustrated here is where most of the good stuff happens in this design. Uh, you'll see four numbered bullets here. Uh, the first one is simply a cascade of audio filters and they're following the rules that uh, I'd mentioned earlier for, for filtering. Uh, none of them exhibits a, a sharp roll off uh, as such, they, they produce pretty good audio. There's several pulls of high pass filtering uh, at around 400 Hertz, and then about a half dozen uh, additional pulls of low pass filtering, at, at, at least at, at last count. Um, the gain block uh, is, is very straightforward. It's done with an op amp and it's about 40 dB of gain there. The mute function uh, warrants a little additional discussion. The, uh, the way the muting is done is with a series FET. And typically what we see in QRP transceivers is a gate to source resistor. And from the gate to ground, there's often a sizable cap uh, capacitor that is. That didn't work here. Uh, because of the way I've got the gain distributed, the signal being applied to that muting FET uh, is anywhere up to six volts or more uh, peak to peak. The uh, capacitor on the gate of the muting FET can't change very often. And what, what was happening was that the, uh, the switch was coming out of cutoff and distorting uh, rather badly. I ended up throwing the capacitor away uh, and it, it reappeared later, uh, and I'll discuss that uh, in a moment. Uh, I see I have two different uh, blocks labeled three, uh, c'est la vie. The, uh, the side tone is a sine wave oscillator. It's done with three RC networks. Uh, each of them contributes about uh, 60 degrees of phase shift. Here's what it looks like coming out of the receiver. This is going to the speaker. It's about a volt peak to peak, uh, although uh, it could be pretty much any level you choose. Uh, that gain was, was set with a resistor. Interestingly, the, uh, this oscillator, the side tone oscillator, runs uh, nearly all the time. Uh, it's keyed on and off by a control line from the controller IC. Uh, if I didn't do that, uh, it would show up as a faint whine in the background. Uh, that whine is down 55 to 60 dB, maybe a little more uh, between uh, keyed side tone and not side tone. It got annoying uh, and I added a, uh, a timeout function to shut it off. The, the issue at hand there was that the oscillator was taking about 15, one five milliseconds to start up to full strength. And the result sounded uh, very soft. I won't say youpy, but uh, that's a good word for it. Uh, on to the next picture here. The, uh, the audio amp is the stuff that's at the near left side of the board. Uh, it's really uh, a fairly potent amplifier. The whole audio chain runs uh, on a nominal five volts and there's an adjustment pot there. The, uh, this amplifier itself uh, also runs with a five volt input. It's an op amp and a complementary pair you know, trio of resistors and some big honking resist, uh, excuse me, capacitors uh, out at the output end of it. 
the audio amplifier is capable of uh, just a little under three quarters of a watt, uh, and that's into an eight ohm speaker. It's more than loud enough. Uh, this component here in the near center is a, a 10 volt low dropout regulator. That might not be adequate for a field. Uh, I don't know, you know, a field application, excuse me. Uh, however, it's intended for use in the shack and uh, it's perfectly good. It uh, typically drops out at only a half a volt of overhead. The uh, back to the adjustment pot for a moment. Uh, the pot is there because uh, offsets can build up in this fairly long chain of, of audio stages. The, uh, the trick to making smooth and successful uh, break-in is not having any electrolytic capacitors uh, in the signal chain. This cap, uh, excuse me, this resistor uh, nulls any offset. The, uh, the DC component, the DC voltage applied to this audio amplifier is the same whether the muting FET is open or closed. Uh, there's nothing to shift. In other words, it's a, it's a constant voltage applied to this amplifier. As such, it required uh, an adjustment. The uh, controls, various controls over here, uh, simply come over from the uh, controller and, and uh, transmitter board. Let's go to the next slide. Surprise. I was surprised anyway. A um, couple of key points here. Quality audio does put a premium on filter design. You want to avoid uh, sharp roll-offs. It's, it's kind of a case of no free lunch. Uh, you can make real narrow filters, uh, but at this point, I really can't recommend it. My own impression, and it's strictly a matter of personal preference, is that good side tone is worth the investment in the higher parts count. It was probably uh, eight or nine parts uh, to get that sinusoidal oscillator. Uh, typically in a QRP rig, it's done with a square wave out of a controller, uh, typically run through a single uh, RC network. At least for me, I've found that I have trouble tuning in another signal. In other words, uh, matching my frequency uh, to that of someone calling CQ. Uh, this really took care of it nicely. And uh, I can pretty much zero right in on somebody and they don't have to use RIT, RIT, uh, to be able to work me. Also, uh, good break-in uh, is quite possible with this approach. Uh, the audio amplifier, the final amplifier, runs at unity gain. And as such, any artifacts that do come through the audio chain aren't magnified uh, by having to charge through electrolytic capacitors. Uh, could it be better? Of course it could be better. Uh, here's a candidate that uh, looks promising uh, and a version of this particular IC uh, was included in the, uh, the NorCal 2030. This was a matter of independent uh, evolution, uh, as I found out about the second time a friend told me, hey, that looks like what the, uh, the NorCal rig does. So, uh, so be it, here we are. This is a Maxim uh, low pass filter I see. This one illustrated here is the Max 294 and the left hand curve uh, is pretty darn impressive. Uh, it has a cutoff knee, it's very sharp, and the frequency response is down 60 dB, only 25% above the cutoff. Uh, you just can't beat that. Uh, I had looked at this uh, uh, as a breadboard, and uh, I was I was impressed with it. Uh, I had a had a uh, keyed sinusoid or a burst sinusoid going into it. And I saw no anomalies when the uh, input signal was uh, 
suddenly applied to this filter. I also wondered about phase response on it. And what you see in the right-hand figure is, well, phase response. Um, as you can see it, the uh, phase increases with frequency. The cutoff is right about in here. If you looked at it in terms of time instead of phase, you'd see that the uh, uh, time or temporal response uh, is pretty close to flat across the passband. That's a good sign. Um, at some point, I'll probably incorporate it into this uh, ongoing design. There is one caution with these, uh, and that is that this works by clocking uh, a digital signal at either 50 or 100 times the uh, cutoff frequency. And that, that depends on the device. There's a max 297 as well, and its characteristics and its clocking are a little different as well. Um, that, that caution only pertains to having an extra digital signal floating around in the analog. Uh, you don't want it uh, getting through and causing problems in the audio chain. Other than that, it looked like a good device. This was the controller I see, uh, the last one I built uh, in this uh, homebrewing effort. It uh, really derives from the uh, Hilltopper design for the four state QRP group. Uh, that was a uh, transceiver measuring about four inches square and three quarters of an inch high. Uh, that was a, a no wires design, uh, the enclosure uh, from David Kripe and M0S. Uh, it was quite popular. There were a couple of hundred of them produced uh, and uh, very well suited for summits on the air work. Uh, what you see here on the right is a 28 pin IC. It's the Atmega 328P. Uh, it's the IC used in the uh, Arduino Uno R3. And to its left, the, the blue object is a Adafruit uh, SI5351 board. Uh, that amounted to laziness on my part. Uh, although I can, I'm able to solder the SI5351 with a lot of magnification. I don't enjoy it. Uh, the, the other factor in this is that this design also uh, supports a serial LED interface. The, uh, the crux of it is that the SI5351 needs 3.3 uh, volts. It's got a maximum of four point something volts, but the serial LED expects uh, five volts. What would have been involved there in addition to uh, soldering that teensy IC would have been in adding uh, level translation uh, out to the uh, out to the LED and also in from the uh, uh, rotary encoder. The rotary encoder itself uh, is a high quality item uh, that was lying around in my junk box, 128 pulses per revolution, and it's just silky smooth. Uh, at present, I have the uh, frequency step set at 50 Hertz. What that lets me do is tune somebody adequately closely, uh, yet uh, yields about six revolution per turn on the tuning knob. Uh, as you can probably see that, uh, well, let me step back a bit. Over to the left end uh, is a uh, pass transistor and basically the same configuration as was used for a transmitter on the hilltopper. Uh, three BS170 uh, MOSFETs in parallel, a, a small binocular core. It's actually doing an impedance step, but, and the uh, low pass filter toroids are behind it. You'll see that I'm using SMAs here, and I'd, I'd like to comment on that as well. They're small. Uh, 
they're very convenient. Um, okay, that slide just illustrates uh, all those things that I just mentioned. And I can now move on to the actual build of the uh, project itself. When I had started, when I had started, I wanted to use a shielded enclosure. This is a uh, die cast uh, bud or Pomona box. Uh, I wound up putting a couple of SMA bulkheads on it, as well as a, a barrier strip uh, for bringing audio and control signals in and out of it. Also just visible on the left end of it was a feed through capacitor for DC power. Uh, that proved to be extremely fragile. Uh, this was a surplus item at, a, at uh, a bargain price and I managed to break two of them. Uh, it's affixed to the enclosure uh, by a 440 thread uh, uh, bushing and nut. Uh, it proved very fragile. Uh, I broke the uh, broke the wire leads off and uh, I wasn't going to go back and do it again. Uh, this entire approach, whoops, this time shown with the uh, boards stacked in the enclosure, proved to be overkill. Uh, I wasn't hearing anything either in or out of the enclosure, out of this enclosure, uh, that warranted uh, that kind of treatment. The other thing that became painfully apparent was that it was uh, kind of vexing uh, to assemble this. There are three boards in the stack, the, the RF board, uh, the IF board, and then this audio board on top. The, uh, the difficulty, of course, came in putting one board in, uh, providing flying wires up to the next layer, uh, and so on. The uh, next uh, slide took this a step further. This is shown with the, uh, with the uh, three boards in the, in the die cast box, and finally the controller, uh, and you can see a couple of SMA interconnects. Um, this is indeed a breadboard uh, in, in the uh, richest sense of the term. Uh, at this point, uh, I was able to receive signals and uh, I was uh, connecting up at uh, the rotary encoder so that I could tune around uh, and listen to it. Uh, for the reasons of uh, the difficulty in assembling it, uh, I dropped back uh, to what's probably a more traditional breadboard. This is shown with uh, three of the four boards uh, on a, uh, a nice piece of quarter inch maple veneer plywood. And uh, only the controller is missing at this point. You can see it, the, uh, the holes for it there in the figure. I believe at this point I was using a, a DDS based signal generator uh, to provide the, uh, the local oscillator. And there were some flying wires uh, plugged into the uh, various headers on the boards to bring out uh, audio, for instance. To, to elaborate a little more on the SMA connectors, they may be unfamiliar to, uh, to folks. Uh, there's no reason to be afraid of them. Uh, they're not that expensive. Uh, this shows a close-up uh, of the uh, connector arrangement bringing RF in and out of a cabinet. The uh, UHF connector is a bulkhead feed-through type uh, and the bracket associated with it. They're both available from dxengineering.com. Uh, no commercial motive here, uh, just a happy customer. And they have a wide assortment of, of stuff, both rigs and antennas. The uh, SMA connectors and cables themselves and the adapters tend to be frightfully expensive uh, if you're ordering them stateside. I'm listing eBay there as a source, uh, preferably with uh, 
a supplier here in the US from eBay. The adapter fitting, uh, that's on the back of the, uh, the bracket you see there, uh, came as a uh, pack of five of them. It, it converts UHF to SMA. I think they were $11 shipped uh, for a set of five of them. So, you know, it's $2.20 a piece. The uh, SMA cables were about the same, 11 or $12 for a set of five six inch cables and other links are available. I think I've seen them up to 36 inches. Uh, at least I gave up at that point. Uh, they make them longer, uh, not interested. Anyway, my experience with bringing uh, RF signals off printed circuit boards in particular was that things like uh, twisted pair or even RG174 would always break after a while. Uh, and then you'd have a mess on your hands trying to remove the, uh, the old coax and uh, solder some new stuff in. I'm gonna stop the sharing here for a moment. Okay, I'm back after a couple of false starts here with the pause that refreshes. And we're gonna to go to share screen here. And I appreciate your bearing with me and uh, we'll get to the good stuff here shortly. One of the other goals I had with this project uh, that I hadn't mentioned up, up front uh, was my desire for uh, a nice packaging on this. Uh, what you see here is the front panel uh, of the transceiver and from left to right, a uh, headphone jack, uh, a speaker above it. Uh, it's about a two and a half inch speaker. And with the three quarters of a watt available from the audio, uh, it really fills the shack. To its right is a speed control I insist on this uh, in, uh, in homebrew rigs, uh, as with the uh, KX3 I'm fond of. Uh, I love having the speed control immediately available for CW speed on the front panel. Excuse me, no resorting to, uh, to going into menus. Gain, of course, is obvious. I don't remember where the knob came from. It's nice and big. Uh, I can actually put a fingertip on it uh, and, uh, and just tune through the band uh, with a fingertip. The uh, rotary encoder inside is uh, uh, very smooth and low torque. Uh, the key input to, is to its right. There's a row of switches here. Uh, FN just stands for function, still undefined. The uh, RIT push button could also be an XIT transmit uh, incremental tune for DX chasing and the step size. None of those is hooked up yet. Uh, I haven't yet missed them. The, uh, the display on the top right is a 16 by two. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's a serial LED uh, and it's red. Uh, I like red on my displays, I guess. Uh, I did have trouble at this phase of the project and took quite a, quite a diversion uh, for a while. I discovered that the audio from the speaker uh, often sounded like it had uh, a rushing noise uh, behind it, but only when, uh, when a CW signal was coming in. I finally traced it to the uh, speaker itself, uh, apparently I've got things to learn about it, acoustics. At one point I discovered that I could damp out that, uh, that rushing sound by reaching uh, into the speaker uh, in between the metal frame and the cone and putting my pinky gently uh, on the cone itself and the, uh, the offending artifact would simply disappear uh, so that was not an electronic issue. 
Uh, I also discovered, of course, that if I pushed harder, uh, the distortion got, came back and got worse. Uh, I've left that for now. I'm currently using uh, an external speaker. Uh, I think what's happening here is that the uh, speaker itself uh, probably works better in an enclosure uh, of its own, uh, something to provide some acoustic damping. Anyway, uh, on the road to solving this, I elected to eliminate the four individual boards and go with a single board. This is pretty darn busy. Uh, this measures five by seven inches and it's all there uh, on one board, which uh, really helps with troubleshooting, certainly a lot more so uh, than with the stack in the die cast box. I kept the uh, SMA connector for the RF input and output what you see here is all four boards uh, from the prototypes combined onto a single board. Uh, I'm now in the process of shrinking it down. Some of the reason for that is that the parts count is very high. The, uh, the, the parts total is about 180 parts. Uh, that's just too darn many. I probably spent two to three days assembling this in uh, one fell swoop. And uh, I don't really want to do it again. Uh, it goes into, and here's a newer shot of the, uh, of the transceiver itself. And uh, I've included this slide to show the, uh, the cabinet treatment. This is made of half inch oak. Uh, I found a set of uh, dresser drawers uh, discarded along the road, brought the drawers home. Uh, they amounted to uh, many feet of this half inch oak. Uh, and I was able to rip about a seven inch width out of them. The, uh, the corners are, are uh, made with box joints. I've always wanted to do this uh, and it lends kind of a nice appearance. Uh, it was quite tricky to set this, uh, these joints up. Uh, there's a jig that does it. There are a number of products that do it. Uh, after only two or three days of frustration, uh, I was making nice box joints. It turned out that the, uh, the bottom panel on this cabinet isn't quite straight. Uh, if, if you go back to an earlier slide, you can see uh, small gaps in the, uh, at the corners. Those in this picture, those are now filled. Uh, there are wood putties available for the popular uh, stain colors, uh, in this case, golden oak. And the stuff hides extremely well. Uh, for those of us who aren't perfect carpenters, uh, it does a wonderful job. In, uh, in cleaning up. So uh, let's go back to full screen here. All right, um, you're probably thinking, wondering, how does it work? Uh, I had a lot of trouble attempting to get audio files uh, so I can describe it. And uh, hopefully I can append this uh, presentation later uh, with audio files uh, once I smarten up. The, uh, the rig itself does run the five watts. I've been extremely successful putting it on the air. Uh, I entered a recent contest, uh, the New England QSO party, uh, the weekend before last, and uh, made contacts there on 40 meters to the tune of 38 contacts. If I called somebody, uh, I always got through. There were no... Uh, no uncompleted QSOs, which was a good sign. Uh, I had also uh, called somebody last night. Uh, he, he turned out to be a parks on the air station. For whatever reason, uh, I beat out two other callers to get through on the first try, which was kind of nice. The, uh, the most recent uh, QSO in my log uh, is with 
HA7, Hotel Alpha 7, Romeo Yankee. Uh, he too came back to me uh, after I had dropped my call sign in just once. And uh, I, on the recording, you can actually hear uh, that uh, he's saturating the receiver uh, at some point. So uh, again, plenty of audio and uh, very smooth operation. Uh, I hope to be on later in the day. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I will plan to, uh, to make schematics and description available to, uh, to the ARCI's QRP quarterly at some point. Um, thank you all for listening to me. 73, and we'll talk later.